Hello! Sorry, great kerfuffle tonight. My internet connection's being a bit nauseating. Um, sorry, yes, I'm a bit late. And also, I've had a few gin and tonics. I've been doing scavenger hunt all day with my family. So me and Tom got steady on some gin and tonics. And Tom just made me watch The Descendants. It wasn't strong. He now really wants to watch The Descendants too. I don't really want to do that. Also, apologies for this. Oh, it matches my blooming cushions, doesn't it? That's all right. Um, we did the scavenger hunt in one of the, what are they called? Not tricks. Tasks, that's the word. One of the tasks was to make a music video. So Tom and I did an homage to the music video for Hello by Lionel Richie. Um, so I made... Uh, I made myself look very 80s, had a nice big wig on, and I went for some, like, 80s colouring eyeshadow, um, and uh, it was very silly, very funny, but you know what was annoying? We didn't win the scavenger. Everybody gave prizes to the stupid children, because they're children. Um, hi, everyone. Oh, everyone's turning up now. Yeah, it was me just me and you, Ruth, for a while, wasn't it? That would do. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Yes, Kevin, I was going to do the story time in the chair for, I really wanted to. I made a fork today for those of you that weren't watching earlier. Um, and I did want to do the story from the fort, but the fort, unfortunately, was put together by someone um, right by the door to the living room and it made it impossible to get in and out of the living room without having to clear, climb over the fort. So we had to put the fort away. But that's my fault for putting the fort down in the bad place. Sorry. So I've had some gin, um, uh, and which is a shame because the next chapter is one of my very favourite chapters in the whole book. So I'm going to really try and like zen and take it seriously because um, I do really like this chapter. Um, hey, I think everybody's nearly here. I mean, I don't really know. I don't know who's here every night. Um, right, yes, shall we start then? Chapter 27. Iris was sitting in the garden, enjoying the warm autumn day. This was her favourite kind of weather, when the heat was all-encompassing and wholesome. The summer warmth from the earth was still lingering, and as it rose up and met with the descending day's sunshine, it melted beautifully into the bones. Iris thought the heat was kinder in autumn. Autumn heat is not sharp like heat in spring, where the sun is just starting to pierce the remaining chill of winter. In autumn, the heat is gentle and relaxed. No need to try too hard. The sun's work for the year is done and now it's just easing itself off in search of new surroundings. Iris didn't much mind the seasons changing. She'd seen enough of them not to become too concerned about the temperature adjusting one way or the other for a few months. Once you reached a certain age, you picked a jacket you like and wore it all year round regardless of weather. It was just easier. Iris liked to imagine that in winter the sun had another home it went to live in. As she and Colin had, would have done had they had the money and the fearlessness. She thought the sun probably enjoyed the break from the English gridlock. It was kind enough to leave its wintry hologram up there to light the days for them, but Iris knew that it wasn't the real sun. Neither was the summer sun real to her. The summer sun was too grandiose, too imposing, too easy to turn up the holiday makers and doubters. She felt someone should tell the English sun not to try and compete with those ones over there. You are. You don't need to be so intense for us. You're as happy as you are. She felt the summer sun showed off like a teenager whose parents had tolerant friends over, the sort who might coo over a mantelpiece performance or two. It was the autumn sun that she liked best. When the campers had trailed back up the M5, the Spanish students had gone home to their Spanish desks, and country life was back to normal. Then the sun seemed genuine. It seemed to relax, content to give its best few weeks to people at home in their gardens. Late evening barbecues and frantic veg patch preparation could be done with this friendly orange face nearby to say, Well done, you did it, another year's busy season done. As she sat on the green canvas reclinable chair, Oh, oh yeah, right, as she sat on the green canvas reclinable chair, the thought crossed Iris's mind that sun worship didn't seem so daft when you really thought about it. 
There was much stronger evidence for a causal link between the sun and prosperity than there was for a god. She'd always thought it was lightly amusing that people had once offered gifts up to a ball of gas like the sun, but now, as she sat with only the sun for company, she realised she actually, that actually she had a lot to be grateful to it for. She and Colin had always loved the sun, sought it out for holidays, made the most of it in their own gardening, and added a conservatory as soon as they had realised conservatories existed. After Colin died, the sun had been the first solace Iris found. His death had brought dull panic to a life she quickly discovered had been emotionally privileged to the utmost. She had felt routinely crushed by the daily bouts of realisation that this new life was permanent and that all the empty spaces opened up by a lack of Colin were now constant. For the first time in her life, Iris had wished for children, begged the heavens to let her wake up having had a child with Colin 40 years ago, so that now she'd have another version of his face to miss his old one with her. But every day she'd woken up childless and alone in a house that felt too big for the love she had left for it. Her own attention to it couldn't feel the corners any more and the visitors who shuffled round kept leaving Tupperware dishes of good intentions that would sit in her fridge for days while she stared at them. She didn't want to reheat a lasagna portion and eat it in front of the TV. She wanted to chop an onion for a soup while the pips played on the radio, and Colin chose that exact moment to wash up and get under her feet. She felt wretched without him. The sort of heartache you thought you'd left behind in your teenage years could still find you despite your wrinkled disguise. Iris hadn't been totally sure if she was allowed to cry and wail and stay in bed, or if people would think that was odd. She felt an unspoken assumption that if your partner died in old age, you were supposed to be ready and prepared for it. The fact that you knew it was coming and had already spent a lifetime together meant that you didn't have have many hard feelings about him going now. Iris didn't have many hard feelings. She'd had wet, mushy feelings, limp feelings, feelings that made her want to keep her eyes closed because thoughts didn't settle so firmly if you were looking at the coloured lights on the back of your eyelids. She clearly remembered that the sun was the first thing that made her want to bother being Iris without Colin. She'd been hungry, and a panicked loyalty had overwhelmed her brain so that she couldn't bear the thought of eating anything but Colin's tomatoes. She wanted to show him she still loved him. She wanted to fill herself with something he had put so much time into. She wanted any tiny, miserable way to be with him. She'd slipped out the back door, up the step, along the path, and down to the grow bags at the the front of the greenhouse. Then she sank to her knees and began piling tomatoes into her mouth. Red, round, green, and hopelessly unripe, yellowing, she pushed fruit after fruit into her mouth, not letting a single pip fall from her lips to to be wasted. Then she sat back down onto the grass and just cried. A tear for every second she had loved that man, and an extra one for every long minute she now had to get on with it without him. She cried until she was exhausted, and then lay back on the grass and drifted off to sleep. When she woke, her first thought was how pleasant the burning sun felt on her skin. It was like fingers massaging into her cheekbones. As her drowsy thoughts came awake and she remembered why she was lying in the garden, she realised that for the first time since his death, her first waking thought had not been Colin. The sun had given her a few brief minutes of respite, the smallest insight into the possibility that one day there would be more thoughts that weren't of a lack of Colin. The sun had given her hope. Her meandering thoughts were interrupted not by the sun, but by the sun. The side, I don't, that doesn't work out loud, does it? But not by the S-U-N, but by the S-O-N. <laughs> the side gate to her little house scraped along the uneven concrete as Jesus pushed it open and poked his head around the wall. Canadian. <laughs> oh dear. Um, hello, Miss. Sh- <laughs> Canadian. Hello, Mrs. Shoe. Not interrupting anything, am I? Said Jeep. That's Texan, isn't it? That's not Canadian, is it? Is it? <laughs> oh, oh no. Hang on. I'm blocking the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Hang on a minute. Can you all hear me now? I'm sorry. I don't look at the comments while I'm reading. Um, 
sorry, I'm just checking that you can all hear me. My computer's on my lap and I have no idea where the microphone is. Um, I wonder where it is. This is the mic. And now better? Okay, right. I will tell you what, let me put the microphone there and I'll back away from the whole situation. Did you hear that chapter okay? Do you want me to go over anything? <laughs> okay, human hairball says, okay, I've made it worse again. But I'm not touching it. Is this terrible or is this okay? This is good TV, isn't it? <laughs> All right, okay, Richard says carry on. Sean says carry on. Ruth, maybe you might have a time delay? I don't know. I don't know. Right, okay, it's okay. Hmm. I could go and get my podcasting mic if we think that that would be better. I probably pushed some fluff into the microphone or something annoying. Okay, all right, I think the general consensus is it's okay, but I will leave the comments somewhere I can see them for the remainder of the chapter. Um, doo -doo -doo. Hello, Mrs. Shoe, not interrupting anything, am I? Said Jesus with a smile. Just a, just a load of internal wittering. Hello, Jesus. Mrs. Shoe pulled herself up in the green canvas chair and worked up the forward momentum to rise from it. Goodness me, this chair is tough. If there's one thing the youth of today really ought to dread, it's not losing one's marbles, it's sacrificing the ability to rise swiftly from repose. How utterly undignified. Anyway, how are you? She got to her feet and strode over to Jesus to shake his hand. Jesus was smiling warmly. I'm very well. All the better for seeing you, he replied. I have another canvas chair in the shed, said Mrs. Shoe. I'll fetch it out for you. She ambled off up to the shed, dug out the canvas chair from beneath the spider webs and dust and brought it back down to the lawn for Jesus to sit on. Would you like a drink, Jesus? I've a secret stash of elderflower cordial in the cupboard if you'd like to partake. Oh, the strong stuff, said Jesus. You're really spoiling me. Go on then. That sounds lovely. Thank you. Can I help at all? No, 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 said Mrs. Shoe, already heading down to the back door. You get yourself comfy. I shan't be long. Jesus settled into the chair and looked about the garden. It was really very well kept, the sort of garden that could only be produced by a certain generation of British adults. It was beautiful. All the flora of the British colonial expeditions sitting triumphantly side by side in neat beds with a lawn to be proud of laying calmly down the middle. The makeup of residents of the English countryside seemed to be roughly 75% pride and 25% absolute refusable refusal to accept the unpalatable. Gardening was an excellent activity to reflect that. An entire history of uprooting the bits they weren't keen on and pilfering the pretty stuff on the surface, all consolidated into a square patch of ground be behind each person's house. An Englishman's home may well be his castle, but his garden is his legacy. Mrs. Shoe returned promptly with two tall glasses of elderflower cordial. She passed one over to Jesus and settled herself back down onto the sagging canvas. You will call me Iris, won't you? Mrs. Shoe began. I feel like I've spoken to you all my life. And whilst I haven't always been Mrs. Shoe when we've spoken, I have always been Iris. Of course, said Jesus. Do you have a surname? asked Mrs. Shoe. Oh, wait, of course you do. It's Christ, I suppose. Jesus smiled. Uh, no, te well, technically it's not Christ. Christ is a term of endearment that was bestowed on me. It means anointed. Last time I was on earth, surnames were not quite what they are now. A, s a name was derived from where you came from, genetically and uh, geographically. They called me Jesus of Nazareth. N -n -na <laughs> oh, my tongue is entirely made of gin. They called me Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> or, or Jesus, son of Joseph. Personally, I like not having a surname. I feel like Cher. Iris wasn't 100% sure she knew who Cher was, but Jesus looked happy, so she smiled back at him and sipped her elderflower cordial. Our Sarah and Hamish, she asked. 
They're plodding along. They're good people. I'm really grateful to them for putting me up. Iris felt, really felt like there ought to be something more pressing she should have to say to Jesus. Surely there should be more floating around in her mind than idle chit-chat. The thing is, Jesus had always been the sort of deity that had welcomed a conversation. Christianity was very much built around talking things through, so even now that he was actually here in front of her, she still felt like she pretty much said most of the important things that had ever crossed her mind. It wasn't like some long-lost family member had turned up and she could finally pour her heart out. She'd been gently siphoning off her heart's contents to this man for decades. There was one tiny, small, silly little thing that she sort of wanted to ask. One thing that she wanted to ask but knew she really shouldn't because it was ridiculous. One thing that she knew the answer to anyway, so what was the point of asking? But, oh, would you look at that? Her mouth was opening and she seemed to be asking it anyway. Did Duncan make it up to you at all? Iris felt so cross with herself for asking if she could quite happily have just stalked out of the garden to save herself the embarrassment of waiting for his reply. Oh yeah, Iris, of course your tiny toy was given a place in heaven. Naturally. Any other dazzlingly stupid questions designed to make you seem like a stereotypically country bumpkin octogenarian? Uh, no. No, he didn't, was Jesus' amazingly straightforward reply. He could be there when you arrive if it was something you still wanted, but I'm assuming as you'll likely be reunited with Colin, you, you won't have much of a need for Duncan anymore, uh, loyal as he was. Iris wouldn't have thought it possible that Jesus could really shock her, but he had. Calmly and quietly, he had listened and responded and given her consolation. She felt a little ashamed that she'd ever doubted that would be his response. Hadn't she been taught since school that this was who and what Jesus was? Why was she expecting him to behave by human standards? No, I suppose you're right. I wound up with them for comfort after Colin died. He was a present from my great niece. Our mother was mortified when she gave him to me. I liked having him, though. It broke the day after something... It broke the day after... Hang on a minute. It... <laughs> It broke up the day having something that relied on me. Yeah, I can uh, certainly see the appeal of feeling needed by something that is very easy to fix, Jesus said thoughtfully. We must be a terrible handful, said Iris. Yeah, no. In theory, you're all actually very easily manipulated should I choose to do it. However, we decided that it was pointless if we got involved all the time. It missed the point of seeing if you could do it alone. I've had my heart broken more times than you could possibly imagine across the millennia. Every time I've had to not meddle, and it's caused a small piece of the world to shatter for someone. But if I intervened, then you've lost your lives, because then you're just an extension of me. You'd just be game pieces. If there's no peril for you, then there's no life. At least, that's what we think. I didn't want you to be like pets. Iris thought about it, and it, it seemed to make sense. You don't seem overly happy with it, though, Jesus. Jesus sighed. It's the age-old problem of no one thanking you for the hard bits. Iris thought some more. She was rather hoping she'd find a suitably eloquent way to reassure Jesus that he was on the right track. It felt right somehow to be able to give back after a lifetime of asking. She supposed this was the Christian's equivalent of being able to go to a concert and scream your delight at the greatest hits. She thought about the lows of her own life and tried to imagine what it would have been like if they'd been smoothed over. I suppose, she began ponderously, I suppose there are a number of tragedies that don't happen. I suppose you intervene at times, do you? Well, I keep the earth spinning and functioning to a certain degree despite your best efforts. <laughs> It's the personal traumas I choose not to attend to, although sometimes I find it very hard to stick to my guns. Listening to a hundred thousand people a day ringing why God why out of their vocal cords is very difficult when the only answer you have for them is because this is the reality of living. I sometimes wonder if I should assume full control and just be done with it, but you'd lose so much that you don't even know you're enjoying. The worst thing that had happened to Iris was losing Colin. She could have not lost him if Jesus had intervened. They could have fallen asleep together on his 100th birthday when no surviving family members could have been too sad. That would have been infinitely nicer. 
What sort of things would we lose? She asked tentatively. Well, Jesus said, if I prevented all pain and loss in your lives, then you'd have no concept of them. Without a concept of the alternative, you cannot appreciate what you do have. When you've been underwater for a long time and you come up out the surface and you take that first breath of air, it's a physically a wonderful feeling. But when you've been out of for a few minutes, you barely even appreciate you are breathing. You forget for days at a time that there's air. If I prevented every sadness coming your way, then everything you consider a joy at present would become as unremarkable as each breath you take. Oof. Yes, that's a valuable thing to remember. Gosh, the joy I felt when I married Colin. That pure elation in my skin when we tied the knot. Oh, I don't think I could have given that up. If you fixed everything, I suppose I shouldn't have been so surprised and grateful to have met him. Exactly, said Jesus. Everyone would meet someone, so you'd all just expect it and wait for it to happen. Oh, no. Iris said with a smile on her face. No, I wouldn't, I couldn't go back and give up that feeling. That feeling of being so, so lucky to have him. Oh, I never once took him for granted. I know you didn't, said Jesus. So does he. Good, said Iris, the happiness slipping a little from her tone. You wouldn't have lost him if I meddled, Jesus tested. Iris cocked her head to one side. Humans like independence. Look at the way we seek it out in the rest of our lives. We leave home as teenagers when we could stay secure with our parents. We war for democracy. We make life harder for ourselves so it's satisfying. I think you have got it right, despite what we say when we're angry. You were uh, pretty angry when Colin died. Yeah. Iris wasn't sure what else to say. Of course she'd been angry. Who wouldn't have been angry? Well, the Dalai Lama, maybe? But he was unlikely to be talking to Jesus about it, even if he had been angry. If heaven was just a bit more of a concrete promise, she continued slowly and thoughtfully, then I suppose the anger might not be so quick to appear. But, but we're never sure, are we? We just know we've lost them, and not that they'll definitely be back with us. Do you know we actually created heaven after you did? Jesus said conspiratorially. You what? asked Iris, baffled. Humans came up with the idea of heaven and we thought it was so lovely that we couldn't see any reason not to do it. <laughs> that was a day of pure beauty for me when my own creation created their own paradise. Mwah! I am more proud of heaven than of anything else in existence. That even with all the other things that have come into being since day one, all, all that you wanted in your heaven was each other. Each other for eternity. That was it. You asked for all the good people to be waiting for you. Ooh, my idea for earth was quite self-contained, but after you dreamed of that, I wanted to more than anything to make it for you. So it is real then asked Iris, enjoying the way the conversation was starting to feel like a cosy lie down in a familiar bed. She felt wide-eyed. A child on Christmas Day knows this last, who knows this last poem as all that lies between her and the day she's been dreaming of. The realisation of what he was saying was the beginning and the end of everything for her, the start of eternity with Colin, and the end of considering life as she knew it. She felt ethereal. Heaven is as real as the emotion you're ready to put into it. I created heaven based on the human imagination of it, but it needed its own rules to work, so I decided on this. It works like one of your hall of mirrors. It takes the things you feel most passionately about and it projects them all around for you. They become all you can see and feel and experience. For you, Iris, should be the love for Colin that faces you from every angle, as it seems to be that which your heart is full of. For someone with less focused passions and loves, it will be a reflection of a wider multitude of things, but to a weaker degree. So someone with four children they love equally will have the experience of that love for them. Someone with no passion, no love, no flair will have a mediocre heaven. Someone with only darkness and no repentance will have that facing them. So, so a murderer will always be watching their murders, Iris asked. 
Well, heaven is not about deeds, Jesus said quickly. Your heaven is not a result of your actions. Your heaven is built on the things you feel and the emotions that drive your behavior. A terrible deed can be cleansed by true repentance so that whilst your heaven may not be the passions of your life, if you're truly sorry, then your heaven will be a sweet respite from the guilt. The deeds are irrelevant. Heaven is a reflection of what fuels you. I felt it was the best way to get people what they deserved. Bosh, said Iris, quite lost for words. Quite, said Jesus, keeping an eye out for any steam coming from Iris's ears, a sure sign he had accidentally blown yet another mine. What would a greedy person feel? Iris questioned, extremely interested. Well, it would depend on the person. Perhaps they were greedy because they want to be better than anyone else, in which case heaven would sadly be a reflection of that keening feeling of inadequacy that has fueled them. It's quite scary, said Iris. Yeah, it is. But even without heaven to reflect this way on you, you, you should have still spent your whole existence with these feelings. So it is in some respects the same as if heaven had never existed. Heaven is also in a way kaleidoscopic in the way feelings can blur and blend and shimmer into one another. You may have loves and strengths in your heart that tumble and change about across one another. It's never too late to repent or fall in love and change it all. And, and heaven's eternal, asked Iris, shy suddenly, not sure if she wanted to know. Heaven will last as long as your passions burn. Jesus turned to her with the warmest smile she'd ever seen. It tends to be longer for those with real love in their hearts. Hate whimpers out first, only a few thousand years usually. Fear clings a very long time, but love, love is for the millennia. Oh, thank you, Jesus. This has meant the world to me. Iris patted him on the back of the hand. You didn't ask about what's going on at all, Jesus ventured. Nope, that's not my concern, I don't think, Iris said lightly. This conversation has been the privilege of a lifetime. I consider myself an extremely lucky old woman. Old, tutted Jesus. Don't give me that. You've got nothing on me. Well, I'd best get you some more cordial than that I? said Iris. Save those old aching bones of yours. In a moment, said Jesus. Let's just sit for a while. It's so peaceful to be with an old friend. Iris rested back into the green canvas chair and closed her eyes, content as she had been her entire life to keep Jesus company. There we go, that's the end of that chapter. Uh, what are you guys chatting about? Iris is a big softie deep down. I love Iris. I think she's one of my favourite characters. I probably say that every episode, but yeah, I like her. Uh, it is is it is it too I don't know if it's too deep I guess it's just ideas I've been playing about with I was raised quite religious until I was like um 18 I think and then I, it all sort of fell apart for me and I was a bit like I don't believe in any of this sadly but I'm so fascinated by the by the background of it and the way people believe in it and I'm sort of I'm a bit jealous of people that get to be religious because there's something that seems quite nice about it. it'd be nice to have things decided um we should we should all go for coffee when this is alive again the world um we should and obviously like when i'm touring again if you come to any of it let me know because it'd be nice to meet you all in person like we got through the quarantine together um reminds you a little of the c.s lewis and the last battle i don't know i don't know is that is that is that narnia i haven't read narnia is that narnia is that c.s lewis i get them all muddled up um it makes you think about heaven even more than the good place. Ah, brick of my heart. <laughs> I love the good place. It's so interesting. All philosophical stuff that's explored without being too heavy and in a way that you can access it. Amazing. Um, oh, Sarah, you saw the first night of my tour. Thank you. I made it to four nights of the tour, I think. Maybe even only three, but we got somewhere with it. Um, it will be continuing. Anyway, right, that's enough for now because my tongue is very dry and uh, and I don't want to ruin any more chapters by reading them badly. So I will post these. Thank you very much. Uh, see you at eight tomorrow? Eight tomorrow. Okay, bye.